Good morning. You might notice that your bulletin says your welcome is being brought to you this morning by Reverend Guy S. Johnson. I'm not Reverend Guy S. Johnson. <laughs> he is away visiting family in Georgia this weekend, so you have me to deal with today, so my apologies up front. <laughs> welcome to worship this morning at Just North UCC Church. I hope that this will be a time of meeting with God, a time of finding that place within yourself that has a yearning for God and that God meets you here. That this is a place of comfort and of healing and of a place where God is present with us and among us. So let us worship together and begin by singing together, Come O Fount of Every Blessing, which you will find in your bulletin and please rise as you are able. Good morning. Good morning. God, we hear your invitation to us. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy burdened. I will give you rest. We acknowledge our soul's need for rest and quiet nourishment. We lay down our burdens. We acknowledge our soul's need of connection with you. We we confess our tendency to overlook rest as a necessary part of soul and self-care. We ask now for body, mind, spirit, whole person nourishment. consolation where we have overspent ourselves refresh us where we have said yes when we should have said no remind us may we become present to our great need for daily bread the presence of Christ in our lives 
Would you join with me in the prayer of invocation? Loving and caring God, we lift up this prayer to you for all who are at the point of exhaustion. You, Lord, who knitted us in our mother's womb, who gives rest to the weary, we ask now to bless us with the ability to come away with you and rest. We ask that you, great physician, be a natural part of self-care. Guide us to meditate on and spend time with you. As you counseled Moses in Exodus 18 that he would wear himself out because the task was too heavy to care for the people of Israel on his own. Lord, we cannot do this work alone. As some struggle in isolation, allow them to feel your presence. Lord Jesus, help us all to be gentle with ourselves and to monitor the trauma that we take on during this time. Help us to be and stay healthy in mind, body, and soul. Lord Jesus, we thank you for abundant life. We thank you for abundant rest. We thank you for compassionate self-care. In you, we experience resurrection. Amen. Turn to your neighbors in whatever fashion you feel most comfortable with and share the peace of Christ. and be seated. We're going to move right into another time of singing together, but I know it's a lot of time for you to be on your feet. So you may sing while you're seated, if you so prefer. So let us sing, Be Still My Soul.
Our Hebrew scripture this morning is from 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 4 to 8. In this passage, Elijah is fleeing toward Mount Horeb. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. Our reading from the Psalms this morning is Psalm number 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his hope, in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Our Gospel reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 41 to 51. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, And they shall, be, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Hear the world of God for the people of God.
today we're talking about feelings. People have a lot of different feelings, and sometimes those feelings are easy to see because our faces show it. Let me see if you could make a happy face. <laughs> and can you make a sad face? And can you make an angry face? <laughs> Good, Jonah. Okay. So let's try something harder. Can you do a joyful face? Or a hopeful face, a peaceful face. You probably had all of those feelings over the last year, and we've had some harder feelings. We've been reminded to take good care of ourselves or to give ourselves a hug. This is a story today, a place inside of me a poem to help heal the heart, and it has a story about lots of feelings and reminds us the most important feeling is loving ourselves. So a place inside of me, a poem to heal the heart, written by Zeta Elliott and illustrated by Noah Denman. There is a place inside of me, a space deep down inside of me where my feelings hide. They wait there in the darkness, a knot of electric emotion, seething, sizzling, waiting till I find the strength to reach inside. There is joy inside of me, a happiness deep down inside of me that glows bright and warm like the sun and, and shines delight on everything I see. There is sorrow inside of me a sadness deep down inside of me that is cold and dark as a watery grave in the bottom of the sea. There is fear inside of me, a terror deep down inside of me that stalks me like a sinister shadow and seeps like poison into my dreams. There is anger inside of me a fury deep down inside of me that is sharp enough to slice through air, flesh, bone, and concrete. And yet, there is hunger inside of me, a yearning deep down inside of me that, re that refuses to be silenced or bound with chains and insists on being free. There is a pride inside of me, no shame deep down inside of me, for I know how long and hard we have struggled, and against all the odds, my people have emerged strong, triumphant, and beautiful. There is peace inside of me, a calm deep down inside of me that flows through my soul like a tranquil stream, and it hushes my whispering doubts. There is still hope inside of me, a promise deep down inside of me that I will use my life to help others, and they will help me in return. There is love inside of me, true love deep down inside of me. I am in love with my people, all people, plus trees and sparrows and sunlight and the rain that falls like a blessing from above. And when I look inside of me to that place deep down inside of me, I remember to love myself most of all.
So when we think about feelings, I wonder what feelings you have deep down. I wonder what ways you like to hide those feelings sometimes. I wonder how you might share those feelings with others. Let us pray. Dear God, help me to know my feelings. Help me to take care of myself in those feelings. Help all of us to love ourselves as much as you love us. Amen. And your friend, Miss D, got something for you to help you remember. So remember, he had a skateboard, and she has a skateboard for each of you. Thank you. You can go back to your seat now. Well, thank you to Kurt for leading us in worship this morning, and thank you to Joanne for sharing that wonderful story about feelings with all of us, and thank you to Hannah for sharing your wonderful gifts with us. We are truly blessed to have you with us, so thank you. Has anybody ever offered you a sandwich, but only given you this? <laughs> if you were offered a sandwich and then only given the filling, it would be disappointing. It would let you down. It would definitely not satisfy your hunger, and it would probably make you angry. But this is what we have been given today in terms of our scripture text. The lectionary promises to give us a sandwich, but it only gave us the meat. And it's pretty skimpy meat at that. If you pull out your text page from your bulletin, if you are following along, you'll see what I'm talking about. Because I'm going to talk to you this morning from the text of 1 Kings. And if you look at that, what do we get from this that is nourishing? We see Elijah going into a desert, sitting under a tree, asking to die, and then visited by an angel who gives him food and water. After he eats and sleeps for a while, he feels better, gets up, and goes on his way for the rest of his travels. Wow. Pretty exciting stuff that we have here today. Basically, we get a story about somebody pulling over at a Holiday Inn for the night and then moving on. What is so fantastic about that? There's no sandwich here. And honestly, I am not all that moved by the little tiny piece of meat we got either. So if we're going to make a sandwich out of this text that we've been given, we're going to have to dig around a little deeper in the story. So I want to go back a little bit and find out why this piece of meat is so critical for our sandwich. We need to go back and find some bread to put around this. In the chapters preceding this text from 1 Kings that we have, we are told of a succession 
of kings of Israel and their deeds. The king in power at the time of this particular story was a guy named Ahab. And we are told that Ahab was notable because he did more evil in God's eyes than any of the kings who came before him. But he wasn't the only problem. It turns out that his wife was even more evil than he was. You might have heard of her. She was a woman named Jezebel. So the big issue with their reign over Israel is that they introduced a new God for Israel to serve. They began to serve Baal and set up all kinds of altars and shrines to Baal. In response to this, God anointed a prophet, Elijah, who's in our text, to speak against them and serve as the national conscience. Jezebel was having none of that. She began killing off all God's prophets and really hoped that Elijah would be one of them. So in response, again, God decided that there would be no rain sent to the land of Israel until this nonsense stopped. So no rain fell for three years. So all of this backstory sets up one of the most vivid and electrifying stories in all scripture. Elijah and Ahab finally meet up in a big showdown. You could envision this as a, a gangbang, like West Side Story style, jets versus sharks. Or you could see this as a WWE smackdown between Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock. However you want to term it, it was an epic throwdown. On one side were the 950 prophets of Baal and Asherah that were backed by Ahab and Jezebel. And on the other side was just Elijah, backed by God. And Elijah sets the stage. He tells Ahab to invite the whole nation of Israel here today so that they can gather around and watch. And then the challenge was laid down. You must decide today who you will serve. Which side are you on? God or Baal? The terms of the contest are laid out. Each side gets a bull that they will prepare and put on the altar for sacrifice. But they aren't allowed to light the fire. They have to call on their God to light the fire for them. Whichever God hears and responds to the people and lights the fire wins the contest. It makes me think of the old game show to tell the truth. Some of you might remember that, where you are told about a certain profession or a certain situation in life and there's all this information given and at the end they say would the real whatever it is please stand up or maybe if you're from a different era it might put you in mind of the rapper Eminem would the real Slim Shady please stand up well you can imagine how this contest went but try to get this scene pictured in your mind Elijah let the prophets of Baal go first. And what a sight it was. The text says that the prophets of Baal called on their God all morning, from morning to noon, to respond and light this fire under the bull. What response did they get? Crickets. Nothing. So Elijah starts some trash talk with them. And why wouldn't he? He knew that how this was going to end up. Where is your God? Doesn't he hear you? Maybe you aren't yelling loud enough to get his attention. Maybe he isn't looking at you. Maybe he's thinking about something really important. Maybe he's traveling and looking after his business interests. Maybe he fell asleep in the midst of your worship of him. Maybe he went to the bathroom and is reading the newspaper. 
Oh, okay, so maybe Elijah didn't say that last part there. But I can hear him thinking it. The bottom line is, if your God is so important and so attentive and so wonderful, where is he? Oh, did that get the prophets of Baal riled up? They shouted themselves hoarse. They cut themselves with their swords and their spears to get Baal's attention. Their blood flowed until the air was thick with the scent of iron. This happened all afternoon and into the evening, but the response was crickets. The text says there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah gets busy, prepares his bull for the altar. He cuts it up and places it carefully on the wood. Then he starts digging in a trench all the way around the altar so that he could fill 12 jugs of water and pour it over the bull so that the water was overflowing into the trench and over the trench and saturated the bull and the wood. And then he said a simple prayer to God. God, let these people know today that you are real. And pow, fire exploded all over the altar. The fire burned up the bull, it burned up the wood, it burned up the stones, it burned up the soil, and it, the text says that it licked up the water. I just like that image, the fire licking up all the water. And the story ends by Elijah having all the prophets of Baal rounded up and seized and killed while the people of Israel repented and came back to God. And now that the people have realized their error and have come back to God, God finally sent rain on the land. The end. So this whole exhausting ordeal of three years is over. Elijah's battle with the Baal prophets is over. His three years of living at odds with the king and his wife, they're over. Three years of famine and death and persecution, it's all over except for this one little thing. Ahab went home and told Jezebel what happened. Remember, she was the one who had started the whole Baal worship thing anyway. So she sent a message to Elijah to tell him that what he had done to her prophets, she was going to do to him by tomorrow. So now we're starting to see the bread that envelops the meat of our sandwich because this is where our text picks up. So let's see this meat that we've been given with new eyes. Elijah has just run for his life for an entire day. He's already exhausted from this whole three-year saga and the whole epic gangbang showdown thing. He is so tired. He just wants to rest. He just wants it all to stop. But instead, he had to run about 90 miles into the desert to get away from Jezebel. And there he collapses under a skimpy little tree and prays to die. And why wouldn't he? Look at all he has been through. We know a little bit about how this feels. The past 18 months have felt like an epic battle where we have been fighting and running for our lives. For months, we've all had to deal with the constant threat of illness, layoffs, and deaths while being denied our typical coping methods of social gatherings, eating out, going to the movies. It's led to a widespread emotional exhaustion that now has a name, COVID fatigue.
The last time that we spent some time together, three weeks ago or so, when I was able to speak with you here from this platform, I introduced the concept of languishing. If you were here that day or if you listened to the service online, you might remember. The concept of languishing is that void between depression and flourishing. It's that middle place, that absence of well-being. And we talked about how this pandemic that we're going through has robbed us of our emotional depth, about how we sometimes feel like we're just muddling through life. And today I want to talk about another emotional and psychological consequence of what we have all been through. You may have heard it called COVID fatigue. The more scientific and comprehensive term is cognitive dulling. Cognitive dulling. What is cognitive dulling? When in the face of any stressor, we tend to respond with what is known as the fight or flight response. You're probably familiar with that. You can fight it, you resist the threat, the stressor, or you have flight, you, re you evade it, you run away from it. But most stresses are not supposed to be long term, are permanent. The stressor triggers our fight or flight response, and then we use a variety of coping methods to calm ourselves down when the stressor is over. But COVID-19 is not giving us that break. We're just not prepared to handle a stress that goes on this long. So as a result, we're coming up with two additional responses besides fight or flight. Freezing, becoming paralyzed in the face of the, the stressor, or fawning, giving in to the stressor. These often manifest as cognitive dulling. So what is that? Cognitive dulling is a form of mental fatigue that leads to difficulty concentrating, decreased productivity, and a decline in emotional and mental health. And this is according to Jennifer Barman, who is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Texas. She said it is the result of our bodies being in survival mode for the past 18 months during the COVID-19 pandemic and enduring heightened stress levels, changes in, in routine and environment and fear of the future. March marked the one year anniversary of stay at home orders across the country, Barman said. We thought the pandemic precautions would last for two weeks or even two months, but they're still going on in various ways a whole year later. There have been glimmers of hope with the vaccines and recent drops in case numbers, but many are still worried about the economy, whether we will see another COVID-19 wave with the new variants, and whether enough precautions are being taken. Many people are living in a constant state of fear, wondering, am I going to become sick? Will I get someone else sick? People are adapting to new work and school environments while trying to emotionally process the huge amount of lives lost over the past year. It all takes a toll. Cognitive dulling is a combination of basically decision fatigue and Zoom fatigue plus all of the other new things that we've been experiencing during the pandemic. It's also the result of our regular experiences and daily routines constantly being altered. Dealing with constant isolation from the pandemic can prevent us from being present, productive, and creative. Cognitive dulling can affect our performance at work and at home. If you're working from home, do you stop working at five? Many are working longer hours because they work through the time they would typically be commuting home. Am I ready to end the day or could I do more? Becomes another decision that needs to be made. If you're working additional hours, are you working at peak performance levels during that extra time? It can be difficult to focus for so long, and many people feel guilty about not performing at a high level. There's a sense of, I'm fortunate to have a job, so I need to do my best. And with our minds and bodies already going through so much, it can be difficult to manage it all. 
Mental fatigue can also leak into many other areas of life, including how we spend our free time. Now we have to think twice about things we used to enjoy on the weekend or in our spare time. We have to question, am I going to feel comfortable playing tennis with a friend or getting takeout from a restaurant? We're constantly in survivalist mode and that affects how we function across the board. Like Elijah, we have literally been running for our lives nonstop for the past 18 months. We have been in fight or flight mode for one and a half years. And the bad news is that the end is not in sight. The presence of new variants that are causing infections to rise again makes us wonder if we will ever be safe, if we will ever be normal, if we will ever be able to go back to doing the things and being the people we used to be. Like Elijah, we have thrown ourselves down and said the same words Elijah said to God. I have had enough, Lord. Well, at this critical point in the story, this moment of pregnant pause, this moment of heightened tension in Elijah's life, he goes to sleep. Often in scripture, people are chided or scolded for going to sleep. They're heated to keep watch, to pay attention, to stay alert, to be attentive to God. But not Elijah. This is a good sleep. A needed sleep, a healing sleep, a COVID fatigue sleep. We don't know how long Elijah slept, but we are told that at some point an angel woke him up and reminded him to eat. So he sat up and looked around and, hey, there was a sandwich. Then he laid back down after eating and went back to sleep. And sometime later, hours, days, the angel came back and said, you need to eat again. So he did. And the text says that Elijah, now strengthened, had the energy and stamina to travel 40 days to reach Mount Horeb. The bottom line is that Elijah needed that space of rest and self-care because he had a lot more to do. He had another big journey ahead. He wasn't done yet. He had 40 more days to travel, 40 more days to walk through the heat and the dirt of the desert because on the other end of that journey, he had to not only appoint his own successor, but he also had to appoint two more future kings. Well, the point of this rather long and involved story about Elijah is this. After all that he went through, what do you think he would have done if he had known what was yet to come when he started the whole battle thing with the prophets of Baal? What would he have done if he could have known everything that was to come? What would you have done if last spring or last summer or last Christmas or this spring when the vaccines came out, you were told that we had 40 more miles to travel? That COVID is not over yet? That we seem to be heading back into a season of contagion and illness and mask wearing and maybe more social distancing and reduced opportunities to be normal. That maybe normal is never coming back. That our bodies and spirits that are so tired of this are not done yet. What will we do now? now that we see and know that this is our reality. We take a page out of Elijah's book. 
just like Jesus probably didn't know about languishing, and Elijah probably never heard of COVID fatigue. But what he did is what we can do. No, not find a desert somewhere and collapse under a tree and pray to die. <laughs> but rather in our exhaustion, take the time to rest, to disengage from the stressors, to be nourished. What does that look like for us today? Professor Barman offers us some suggestions, starting with self-care, self-care, self-care. Self-care is something everyone needs to strive to do to give themselves a break, she writes. Options include practicing mindful meditation, meal prepping so you can maintain a good diet, doing a hobby you enjoy, taking a bath, playing with your kids or your pets, going for a walk, or reading. Just taking some time every day to not have to think can do wonders for your mental health. And encourage those same self-care habits in your children and your grandchildren as well. She also suggests check in with yourself. It's critical to know your limits and be kind to yourself when you reach them. It's okay to say no. It's more than okay to set healthy boundaries for things that no longer serve you. This can be anything from not checking your email at a certain time to not attending every Zoom event that you're invited to. Also, manage stress in one, one area of your life. Focusing on one area of your life, like work or a certain relationship that you can control your stress in, can help you feel empowered. It can give you a sense of normal in one area that you can build upon in other areas. And look for opportunities to laugh. Laughing helps release endorphins, which is our body's feel-good hormones. And don't forget to ask for help when you need it. For us, as for Elijah, we want the journey to be over. We want the stress, the fear, the running to be done. But it isn't. So in these moments, let us hear the word of God as it comes to us like it did to Elijah. Stop for a while. Lie down and get some sleep. Oh, and have a sandwich. <laughs> Amen. We come to our time and we share our prayers together. I'll share the prayers that have been submitted for us to pray and consider together. First, from Ellen Baumgartner. Creator, please open the hearts and minds of all the world's leaders to the extreme crisis of global warming so they will take the strong actions needed to save our precious home, Mother Earth. Judy Rangler asks for prayers of healing for our precious genie. Greg Allen asks prayers that everyone in the country and the world has the grace to get along with one another Breathe, celebrate what we share, respect our differences, live and let live. Mark Cortez asks prayers for Corey, Mark's husband, who is having surgery this upcoming Friday for his strength and recovery and for the medical team's success. And he also asks prayers of thanksgiving for an upcoming third anniversary for Mark and Corey. Ed Snively asks prayers of strength and comfort for Cecilia and Russell following the recent passing of Robert. Beth Marler asks prayers for God's healing and comfort from my friends Mary and Lynn Wybrew and their family. Last year their son died and this week their daughter-in-law died. The couple left two children ages 18 and 21. Uh, the Child Care Board 
through Laura Gaines asks prayers of thanksgiving for the gifts of craft supplies and kindness from the congregation. They ask prayers of comfort and healing for parents who are struggling with health challenges and prayers of thanksgiving for the support and compassion of teachers for the families. And Pastor Guy asks for prayers of thanksgiving for a successful visit with his family in Georgia this weekend. Also, uh, prayers from Vincent Sherry for prayers for Eric Sherry, who has three aneurysms and is having surgery on Tuesday. And a prayer of gratitude from John and Sheila that they have sold their house of 35 years and found their forever home just seven minutes from church in the Hayden Falls condo complex. Let us bring our hearts, our minds, our souls, our spirits together for prayer together. God, we come into this space that is already filled by you. We come here seeking to breathe, seeking to rest, seeking to have the burdens of our hearts, the burdens of our hearts lives, the burdens of our souls, the burdens of our woundedness lifted, if only for a moment. We may not be in the desert under a tree praying to die, but God, we understand exhaustion. We understand fatigue. We understand frustration at our lives not being what we expect or what we want or what we even understand. So God, in these places, in these voids, in these moments of languishing and fatigue, invite us into the space that is God. Fill that void within our spirits that is God-shaped Renew us, refresh us, remind us of those gifts you have given us to take care of ourselves, to take care of one another, to lie down, to rest, to sleep, to eat to find in each other the hope, the vision of you. God, may we be to one another what you are to us. And may we find in our relationships together the healing, the community, the compassionate grace and mercy that you offer to us every day. And God, we give you thanks that we are not on this journey alone. You are here. We are here together. Guide us, lead us, sustain us, empower us, refresh us. And God, join now together in the words that we share together, in the sentiment that we feel, and in the experience that we have as we pray together the words that you have taught us to pray. Our Mother and Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done. Done. <clears throat> Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite Ellen and Joanne to share with us some words about bread.
So it's just north. We provide meals at the Y Family Homeless Shelter four times a year. And many of you enjoy serving. What if families were not homeless because they had affordable housing? Ellen, you've been involved with the Bread Affordable Housing Committee. Why is that important to you? Well, I have learned stable housing is a basic essential for stability in all aspects of families' lives, especially for children. And I kept noticing all the luxury um, apartments and condos going up in the short north area and different parts of the city, but I did not see a, a housing going up that would be affordable for low-income people. And um, I was not the only one who felt that way because that became the issue that Bread chose to work on that year, and I jumped on the committee. Um, and do you know that more than 54,000 people in the community are paying more than half their income for housing? Wow, how can they do it like that? How can yeah. you live that way? <laughs> I mean, right. there's food and utilities and yeah. clothes and school supplies and transportation. That puts them at the risk of eviction and homelessness. Right. And more than half the families in shelters were working when they entered. Um, it just isn't fair. Wages are low. They're not adequate. Housing is not affordable. Bread is advocating for Franklin County Commissioners and Columbus City Council to use a third of their funds from the American Rescue Plan toward affordable housing. And we've gotten some agreement on that. Um, this could mean um, housing for thousands of child care workers, restaurant workers, adults with disabilities, and families who make less than $30,000 a year. Together, our voices can make a difference. So Bread advocates, when we show up, we make our voices heard. Officials notice when voters are speaking. Bread makes a difference for justice in our community. That's a reason I support Bread. Yes, and we own our organization because we support it financially. No one puts financial pressure on us because they have given conditional support. So both Ellen and I ask you to prayerfully and generously give to Bread. Bread has asked Justice Ministry Network members to give $200 if they are able, and some give more. Both of us give at least that much, and we're asking you to give as you're able. So today is the day of our special offering, but you can give any time in the next week or so, and just make your check payable to North Congregational Church with bread on the memo line, uh, on your bank transfer, or Zelle. What you give means a lot for justice to our community. Thank you. Thank you. So Joanne has lifted up to us some ways that we can continue to provide our offering to the church in this time when we are not passing the plate through the, the aisles, through the pews. If you have an offering that you wish to give today, you may do so in the narthex after the service. Or you may use any of those methods electronically or you can mail a check to the church that you may continue to support the ministries of North Church. Let us now stand and sing our offering response for gifts that have been given and will be given. For gifts given and received, O God, we offer thanks and praise. May we share our abundance with all who have need. May we share our hope in like measure. Amen. Please be seated and I invite our moderator, Diane, to come up and give us a few words. Thank you. 
Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, faithful friends. And we were blessed by you this morning, Heather, for your insightful, um, relevant message that we all need to hear and practice daily. It's good to be here and to see all of you. As we watch with the uncertainty of how the pandemic is unfolding with yet a new variant on the horizon, um, that message is completely on target, unfortunately. So for now, we will continue our policy of masking when we are in the building. And um, today we invite you to move on outside, uh, not congregate in the narthex. We have a few little refreshments out in the shady area. And I hope that you will gather outside and take advantage of the fact that we are all together here and we can meet safely outside, um, catch up with one another and um, appreciate this, this special time this morning. So we'll um, see you out there. Those of you who haven't had a chance to reconnect, um, we invite you to do that. The Board of Christian Education is planning another outdoor activity for Sunday, August the 22nd during the 1030 church service. The activity is open to children and youth pre-K through grades eight. There will be more information about it, so watch for that. The hint that they've given us is it will be about water. Hmm, I wonder what that's all about. And from evangelism, I hear that there will be some cornhole games coming soon to our parking lot. Um, watch for more information about that on Sunday, August 15th, correct? Um, and you can contact any of the members of evangelism if you have questions before that time. Oh, that's next Sunday. Two to four next Sunday. I can't quite get my head around the fact that we're in mid-August already. Ooh. Once again, I thank you for your continued patience during this time of our church. Next week, I will finally be able to announce the members of our pastoral search committee. It's been difficult, just things, <laughs> scheduling, talking to people, um, just trying to get it all together. And I will continue to, or ask you to uh, continue to feel comfortable asking any questions about this process to Pastor Guy or myself. Our journey definitely has some bumps and we are all called to go through this very unfamiliar, uncharted territory, open to the challenge and working together. I know that our collective faith and spirit will continue to guide and support us through all this all these challenges as we move forward so for some more mundane things to think about uh, the pew pads at the end just a reminder um, do that thing um, <laughs> And then take a look around and make sure you pick up anything you brought with you. And as I say every week, I hope you do take time every day, even if it's just a few minutes, to rest and renew. Remember to be gentle with yourself and be of good heart. Thank you and hope to see you all outside. Thank you. So if you are able and you wish to, please rise and we will sing our way out. Lead us from death to life. You will find at the end of your program, please rise.
in the midst of our COVID fatigue, there is one positive that is universal. And that is that we are all experiencing this together. Often when we go through hard times in our lives, difficult spaces, difficult journeys, we may do it alone. We may have our own individual loss or grief or brokenness and we feel like no one understands. But wherever we are and whatever we're doing, we're all experiencing this together. And we will all heal together. And we will all be renewed and refreshed and come out of this together. May God fill your hearts with a sense of peace and refreshment and nourishment. And don't forget to have a sandwich. Amen. Amen. Amen.